Gim, do you want to start us off? Yeah, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Um, thank you to the regular subscribers of Girl with the Golden Pen for returning. Um, lovely to see uh, your faces and names. And thank you so much for, for new folks for coming along. It's really lovely. This was quite an impromptu thing. Um, David and I wanted to have a chat about um, Casino Royale and the anniversary and 70 years of Fleming's Bond um, as, a, as a podcast and for the new um, 007 GB Club magazine and then at the same time I was getting some comments on social media saying are any of your events in the UK streamed so we thought maybe we'd try and put it together and it's just an idea we had last week and it's really amazing to see so many people come along so thank you all so much um, and I'll, I'll hand over to David. Yeah, so thank you again to echo what Kim's just said. We are celebrating 70 years of Fleming. We've purposely tried to pitch this session at people who know all the books inside out, back to front, as well as people who've never read one of the Fleming books. So it hopefully will work um, for everyone. We're never going to assume that anyone has read um, the story. And we're, probably, we're going to do a couple of very short readings at various points. So we'll kind of contextualize those bits as well. Um, yeah, and so the plan is for us to talk very personally about our love of Fleming. Um, although both of us have a English literature, well, an English background, that's our kind of educational background. Uh, we're going to be talking here as just mad Flem Fleming fans tonight. And um, so that's the point of view we're coming from. This isn't literary criticism intensively. We may slip into it occasionally, but we'll try to slip out as subtly as possible. Um, so, yeah, and uh, our aim is to talk for about half an hour or so, perhaps a little bit longer and then for you to um for you to ask us as many questions as you want really um so keep have a think about what those questions might be and then we'll also give you a prompt as to uh, when we're kind of winding our bit down so that you can uh, start typing those in um we've planned out a series of discussion points but these things are kind of organic so let's just see sort of where they lead i thought it might be a nice idea kim if we kind of started with our very first encounters with Fleming and actually we've realized there is a bit of a common denominator here I think <laughs> so your your famously your first Fleming book was from Russia with Love is that right yes so our common denominator here is Naked Men this is the first ever uh Bond novel that I bought it's from Russia with Love and Pam paperback and I don't know if you can see this rather charming picture of Sean Connery's hairy chest uh, so this was the first one I bought when I was about 12 because I wanted to try writing spy fiction. Um, and it opens with this description of uh, what well, of Red Grant. But our opening line is the naked man who lay splayed out on his face beside the swimming pool might have been dead. And immediately 12 year old me was like, who is this man? Why might he be dead? Why is he naked? What is going on here? Um, and then I was a Bond fan for the rest of my life. So. Uh, that cemented it for me. And David, I think yours is... I, I also similar. had an encounter with a naked man the first time. That, sound, that sounds a little bit wrong. Uh, but you know you know what I mean. Um, the, the, um, I don't think that guided my decision to choose this as my first Bond book, is, um, especially as I was aged eight at the time. Um, and I remember taking this into school um, as my reading book and my form tutor kind of with a bit of a rise day eyebrow going, why on earth have you chosen that? But didn't say anything about it. But yeah, this is the famous Thunderball cover um, read, designed by Raymond Hawkey, which has uh, which has two bullet holes in the cover, which is pretty cool. So a really, really iconic cover. Um, but yeah, um, I mean, as I say, I think I was probably about eight years old. I don't think I picked up another Bond book for quite a few years after that. But I've tried to rack my brains trying to think what eight-year-old me thought of a James Bond novel. So what can you remember anything about apart from the startling opening, Kim? Can you remember much about what, you, what your childhood reaction to reading a Bond novel was? I remember really falling in love with the writing and with Fleming's very vivid style, which felt like nothing I'd really read before. Um, I mean, my transition here was probably from the famous five to James Bond. So that's a, a big change stylistically, um, mm. as well as, you know, in levels of sex and violence. Uh, although it's, you know, it's between the lines with the famous five. I think we can all agree. But I <laughs> fell in love with this very kind of visceral, uncanny way that Fleming writes because it felt like an invitation into an adult world um, yeah. and this world of secrecy and being an observer. Mm. And that was something that really, for me, was wrapped up in, I think, my development as a writer because I would 
go around and spy on all of my neighbors pretending I was James Bond and I would write stories about them and I would come up with these elaborate narratives about their lives um and one time somebody actually in our area there was a body found in a house and I, I spanned this whole you know I cracked that case for the police basically it was just a shame they never asked me uh but the my love of Fleming and my love of spy fiction was really bound up in my love of writing so yeah. it, it really goes back to Fleming yeah Absolutely brilliant. Is it worth saying at this point before we carry on as well that we uh, we agonise over which editions of the Bond books to be referring to today because we are going to be reading a few little bits from some of them as well. So um, I've gone for the uh, the pan 1960s set. I don't actually have the complete set. I uh, um, Some of these are my dad's and then about the other half of them I didn't have. I just picked up from charity shops and car boot sales and things like that over the years. So uh, that's my edition of Casino Royale. I that love I'm, that. I'm rereading a bit from. It's very battered. It's been on holiday with me multiple times because although I really cherish these, I do still read them. So, uh, yeah, although Casino Royale was actually the last Bond book I actually chose to read because I thought, oh, it's just going to be about a card game. Why Why would I Why would I do that? I know we're going to be talking about what order we read them in in just a moment, but um, what what we what's the editions you're going for tonight? So I have with me the very beautiful new um, Fleming mm. editions, which some people might have got their hands on already. Um, and some of these covers are so beautiful. Um, my favourite of the new covers is The Spy Who Loved Me, which is also one of my favourite books. I really love this kind of very neon effect. Yeah. Um, so if you if you can get your hands on these, I recommend them. That's also one of my favorites. So again, this probably isn't going to work on the podcast of this, but uh, I'm currently holding up the pan Spy Who Loved Me, which is a, a roadmap of the area with uh, like uh, like a crease in the map and everything. It all, yeah, for some reason, just a really strong design on that one as well. Um, Another thing that yeah. um, this also won't work on the podcast are purely audio uh, media, but I feel I should say it in defense of David, because some of you will have seen the video of him teaching me how to tie a bow tie. Mm. And today, obviously, my bow tie is not tied. I did try. It's not that David isn't an excellent teacher. He obviously is literally by profession. It's that I had several martinis in me at the time while he was teaching me how to tie a bow tie. Um, and then the same. Not very good for the memory, is it? So... <laughs> So at some point, sober, he will he will teach me how to tie a bow tie. Uh, but for now, I'm afraid this is it. I, I will confess there are times when I'm just staring, staring at the mirror and the more I think about it, the harder it is to tie the bow tie. So I think on that night, having doing it live on video, I think actually having had a few martinis probably cleared my mind enough to be able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> So who knows? I'm sure there's a peer reviewed study out there in the correlation between drinking martinis and being able to tie a bow tie successfully. But, you know, yeah. if anyone finds it, please let us know. <laughs> oh, I've just seen in the chat, we've got a few of you putting in uh, your first bonds, which is really lovely. Thank you, mm -hmm. Alice, for the suggestion. Um, so Alice's was Dr. No Tempe from the charity shop. That's a good find. Yeah. Um, then we've got Nick's is Casino Royale. Um Dave, uh, so Anthony's also Casino Royale. Memories coming through. Thank you for those. Um, oh, and Silverfin, that's a nice call out for Charlie Higson. Um, and uh, Dr. No as well. So thank you. It's really lovely to see that spread. And David, maybe that's a nice point for you and I to chat about the order that we read them in. Yeah. So as I said, I'm pretty sure I'm, I know that Thunderball was the very first one. And I know Casino Royale was the very last one, as I said, because I thought, oh, it's just going to be about a car game because there wasn't really a film of that. Apart from I, I can't remember if I'd seen the 1967 spoof, mm -hmm. which I, I really admire um, in itself. But yeah, so the start and end points, I kind of remember. I know Moonraker was first. Um, sorry, one of the first, like the second or third or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think I put off the ones generally, which were kind of too similar to the films, or at least I thought were going to be similar to the films, like on Her Majesty's. I remember my dad always saying the early one, the early films are very much like the books. So I was mm -hmm. like, okay, if they're very similar to the films, what's the point in me reading them? And then, of course, when I actually got round to reading them, it was like, oh, no, actually, there's quite a lot of differences here. But mm -hmm. how, how, how did you kind of pick them up in sort of a random order as well? Absolutely. And um, Alice, it's, it sounds like similar to you. Mine was very much charity shop governed because I was after the pan editions, which I loved. So it just depended on when I found them in charity shops or secondhand bookshops. 
But I do remember that um, obviously from Russia with Love was the the first one. And then the last one that I read in my first reading um, was You Only Live Twice. And I remember that was the last one because then in my experience of Bond, it was like that was his ending. Um, yeah. So I didn't, although I, you know, I knew that um, The Man with the Golden Gun came afterwards. In my mind, he had this quite, um, I don't know, almost melancholy ending because of the end of You Only Live Twice. I actually, I know we agree disagree on most things here, Kim, but I actually really, I find the ending of You Only Live Twice, apart from the bit where he's talking about going to a man in Blood of Ostok. So we did yeah. say we wouldn't kind of assume any prior knowledge if you've never read You Only Live Twice. Um, spoiler alert, uh, but essentially he ends up killing Blofeld, uh, avenging his wife and thinking he's a Japanese fisherman, which I think is quite a nice ending for James mm-hmm. Bond. But you, you're right. He's tinged with that. Re- you know, he's eventually going to remember kind of yeah. at least enough of who he is to get into some kind of trouble and be brought back. But I do quite like the idea sometimes of James Bond being able to live out happily ever after as a Japanese fisherman. As outlandish as that sounds, that is kind of like the happiest ending, I think, realistically, we could ever have for James Bond. Mm, If he could ever walk off into the sunset, maybe that would be the time. Yeah, absolutely. And we were going to have a chat about um, the differences between the books and the films. And maybe now's a a good point, because um, if folks, it sounds like from the chat, um, most of you have read Fleming, which is brilliant. Mm. Um, but for for some people, if you haven't, uh, you might be surprised by hearing some of the differences between the, the books. And yeah. The books. Yeah. I mean, particularly for me, when people, particularly in people online use the phrase, um, you know, that's pure Fleming, like mm. a moment in one of the films. And I've got to admit, a lot of the time I'm like, really? Um, I'm ha- it, it does tend to be the moments where James Bond does something really like horrible (laughs) and he does something really kind of like a hard-boiled hero might do from like film noir or um raymond chandler or or even raymond chandler's characters aren't exactly kind of hard men and i'm like actually i mean taking that as the example for someone the license to kill he really doesn't like killing very Mm -hmm. much and um i mean um We've we've talked about before the opening of Goldfinger, which is, I think, one of our favorite openings where mm-hmm. Bond's sitting in an airport, basically drowning his sorrows, kind of feeling of regret and recrimination because he's had to rub someone out. He's had to he's had to murder the Mexican. And can can we imagine a, a, a Bond film having an equivalent scene in it? I don't know. And when we compare that to the opening of the film, in the film he kills somebody and it's with the oh positively shocking quip and it's really funny yeah. and it's this moment that's that's purely played for laughs. Whereas in the novel, he describes killing people as the death watch beetle of the soul, doesn't he? Mm. It's this it's this thing that's really eating away at him. And I think that's one of the primary differences between the novels and the films that he is a character that things eat away at. He is a character with an arc and he changes across the books and each book has an effect on him. Whereas the films until very recently were standalone affairs. So he almost returns to a kind of default setting at the beginning of the next film. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And I, I, something I find fascinating is that uh, I know you're a massive fan of Johanna Harwood, uh, you know, you, um, being able to use her name for for one of your double O characters in, in Double or Nothing. But um, I always remember um, one of those interviews, Johanna, saying that she was the one who put more Fleming back into the films and kind of made him a much more palatable hero. Whereas Mm. a lot of the men who were writing the screenplays were trying to kind of harden him up, but it wasn't very, very Fleming. Um, And I I find that fascinating that he kind of plays with kind of gender expectations a lot uh, and and all that kind of thing. Absolutely. When you compare Fleming's writing to... um say Bulldog Drummond or, or yeah. some of the kind of more extreme end of hard-boiled fiction, there you have characters who are almost engaged in a kind of slapstick cartoonish violence yeah. and it's and it's all quite um, gratuitous really, whereas violence in, in Fleming is very much done at a human scale. Um, mm-hmm. and, and again, going back to your point about how sometimes people will say, oh, that's very Fleming about something that's like especially sadistic or, or over the top, actually his books are on a much more human scale. And I think that's one of the 
things that makes them so compelling um, and that the films picked up on and makes the film so compelling is that the world of Fleming shrinks down conflicts that feel incomprehensible in scale and unmanageable. It shrinks them down and it makes it James Bond versus a human representation of that crisis. So Fleming was a writer who was coming out of crisis, out of World War II and writing in, in the face of a looming crisis as the Cold War is gathering pace. And I think that's one of the reasons that, that Bond remains so relevant and then often has these kind of upticks in relevance because he's a character who um, really is suited to a time of crisis and is comforting in a time of crisis. So for me writing now, writing in the, I guess coming out of or in the shadow of the war and terror and then writing in the sort of the looming specter of the climate crisis and the pandemic, this feels like a very comforting character to be able to lean on. I agree. Um, I mean, uh, uh, and let's, you know, sorry to bring it down to this level, but let's not forget if we're talking about differences between the films and the books as well. Um, the books feature a giant squid battle. <laughs> they do. There are there, <laughs> there are those moments which I'm just dying to see represented on screen at some point. So when people do say this is this is very Fleming like, I'm like, so you mean the giant squid bit? <laughs> um, you know, and that's probably quite an extreme, but there are there are those moments which you go, okay, he went there. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, and Alice is saying, and death by Guado, that's so true. Yes, I love yes. that bit in the um special features of Dr. No, where you see them trying to make it look threatening, what's happening um to Honey Rider when she's chained to the ramp, and <laughs> it just looks so pathetic. Isn't it supposed like to be? Like you can just it, sneeze and get out of it. <laughs> is it giant ants? I'm trying to remember. I'm a risk of getting wrong. It's like kind of spider crabs. <laughs> that's it, spider crabs. That's yeah. it. That's it. They're supposed to be attacking her, but she's literally just like, yeah. there going, this water is going to very, very slow. I suppose that's horrible in its own way, but... Um, yes. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to make crabs look menacing on screen. Yeah. Um, we have chosen a few um, moments from uh, books to share that we love. Um, do you want to start us off? We're going to share. Yeah. With you, so um, we decided to go for, and this was so difficult. I've spent a stupid amount of time choosing these, to be honest, and I'm still not sure I've chosen wisely. So, um, yes, yeah, so we chose our favourite ally introduction. We chose our favourite villain of the book. So you're probably thinking now which ones are your favourites. And then we also chose our favourite little piece of description because um, actually Fleming is, without getting too far into literary criticism, I always think Fleming is so underrated as a literary writer. He's very direct. He's got that new journalistic background. But there are some exquisite passages. But we've actually just gone for very, very tiny chunks. Uh, but let's just start with um, the allies. So um, I'm going to go with, I was going to go with Felix Leiter introducing Casino Royale because that is such, I've poured over that particular intro so much. But in the end, I decided to go, it's a little bit longer, so just bear with me a second. I'm going to read out the introduction of Mary Ann Russell from the short story From A View to a Kill. Um, so push out any images you have in your mind of, um, you know, Bond girls from View to a Kill, like Stacey Sutton and Mayday and so forth. Um, this is a, an interesting character. So Bond is sitting in Paris um, at a cafe. And then here we go. A battered black Peugeot 403 broke out of the centre stream of traffic, cut across the inside line of cars and pulled into double park at the curb. There was the usual screaming of brakes, hooting and yelling. Quite unmoved, a girl got out of the car and, leaving the traffic to sort itself out, walked purposefully across the sidewalk. Bond sat up. She had everything, but absolutely everything that belonged in his fantasy. She was tall. <laughs> and I'm trying not to laugh, sorry. She was tall, and although her figure was hidden by a light raincoat, the way she moved and the way she held herself promised that it would be beautiful. The face had the gaiety and bravado that went with her driving, but now there was impatience in the compressed lips and the eyes fretted as she pushed diagonally through the moving crowd on the pavement. Bond watched her narrowly as she reached the edge of the tables and came up to the aisle. Of course it was hopeless. She was coming to meet someone, her lover. She was the sort of woman who always belongs to somebody else. She was late for him. That's why she was in such a hurry. What damnable luck, right down to the long blonde hair under the rakish beret. And she was looking straight at him. She was smiling. 
Before Bond could pull himself together, the girl had come up to his table and had drawn out a chair and sat down. So what I love about Mary Ann is she's fantastic all the way through that story. Um, and But it's that Bond is actually feeling quite self-conscious, which I think is very much something that people who haven't read Fleming before perhaps probably find quite surprising. So it's mm -hmm. like we're used to the, the movie Bond just assuming that any woman is going to fall for his charms. But here he is going, there's no way she's interested in me. Oh, no way she's interested in me. Yeah. Also, I, I like that. her rakish beret. As a fan the, of a rakish beret. The myself. rakish beret, yes. I couldn't, <laughs> couldn't resist. Yeah. It makes me smile. Um, I also, this may not be podcast friendly, uh, but have to read out Alice's pun because it's too good. Uh, I'm definitely not going to make a Tomorrow Never Dies joke about Bond sitting in Paris. I, I couldn't possibly. Laugh behind our hands. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much for that really David I love that passage that is also one of my all-time favorite um, character introductions and this was really um, hard to pick the allies um, and in fact I, I picked three um, but I, I will narrow it down um, the two that I'm not going to read you because they're too long but I urge you to go and reread or read yourselves um, one is Thunderball when we have Domino's introduction and she does this very long monologue, it's about four pages um, of this fantasy that she had as this very lonely teenager about a character illustrated on a packet of cigarettes. And she has this fantasy about somebody who cares about her. And it's this hero in her mind. And it's a beautiful bit of writing. And it's almost, I feel like it's almost Fleming saying, look, I could have written plays if I wanted to. You know, you can, you can really imagine it out loud performed. Um, so do take a look at that. And then another long passage that I won't read to you, but urge you to go and look at is in Moonraker when we have the first chapter from Gala Brand's perspective. And she, of course, is the undercover special branch officer and Bond is turned up on her mission. And she's thinking, oh, God, what good is this agent with his smile and his gun tricks here to me? Um, and I love that whole uh, chapter, seeing Bond from her perspective. So another favourite. But a little bit I'm going to read to you. Um, is when Bond meets Tiffany Case in Diamonds Are Forever. Um, and this is a really interesting um, technique that Fleming uses where he'll often introduce a female character and have Bond imagine what the character thinks of him. Um, so again, that kind of points to, um, as David was saying, a sort of heightened concern for what others think of him, which perhaps isn't what we think of Bond. Um, and it also points to almost a reversal or a kind of bouncing back on a mirror of the male gaze, which I find really interesting. So this is Bond looking at Tiffany Case, imagining what she thinks. She was very beautiful in a devil may care way, as if she kept her looks for herself and didn't mind what men thought of them. And there was an ironical tilt to the finely drawn eyebrows above the wide, level, rather scornful gray eyes that seemed to say, sure, Come and try it. But brother, you'd better be tops. Love that. So that's my uh, ally introduction. And next up, we're going to have some villain introductions. Over to you, David. Oh, right. Um, yeah, this was this was really difficult because although Fleming, I think probably out of everything, and this is perhaps a bold claim, I don't know, but I think brilliant girls brilliant allies but i think fleming's villains are probably the standout for me so this this was really tricky and this is probably going to seem like a really strange choice because um he's not one of the most kind of you know that a lot of fleming villains are quite physically distinctive he's not really but there's something about him and i love all those slightly strange uncanny bits that Fleming gives his characters that tell you that something's not quite right and Bond is very perceptive when it comes to picking up on those things so I'm actually going to go and it's actually from the same volume but a different story uh, the story which is possibly my favorite Fleming short story because it actually shows Bond at his most sentimental Bond uh, particularly around animals Bond really hates it when people murder animals um, and the Hildebrandt rarity is probably the strongest example of that. So the villain I'm going to go for is Milton Crest, um, who's quite different from the character in Licence to Kill. It's kind of smushed together with Sanchez's character in that film. Um, so quite a different character. 
Mr. Milton Crest had come quietly into the room and was standing looking at them. He was a tough, leathery man in his early 50s. He looked hard and fit, and the faded blue jeans, military cut shirt and wide leather belt suggested that he made a fetish of doing so, looking tough. The pale brown eyes in the weather-beaten face were slightly hooded, and their gaze was sleepy and contemptuous. The mouth had a downward twist that might be humorous or disdainful, probably the latter, and the words he had tossed into the room, innocuous in themselves, except for the patronising fella, had been tossed like small coin to a couple of coolies. To Bond, the oddest thing about Mr Crest was his voice. It was a soft, most attractive lisping through the teeth. It was exactly the voice of the late Humphrey Bogart. Bond ran his eyes down the man from the sparse, close-cropped black and grey hair, like iron filings sprinkled over the bullet head, to the tattooed eagle above a fouled anchor on the right forearm, and then down to the naked, leathery feet that stood nautically square on the carpet. He thought... This man likes to be thought a Hemingway hero. I'm not going to get on with him. It, I think it's just quite a subtle piece of writing because we always ha kind of have these grotesques. Um, and naturally, there's just something Bond doesn't like about Milton Crest. And we don't like him either. Mm. And it's really interesting that um, equation with Hemingway and then that addition, I'm not going to like him because in popular culture, there might be considered to be a similarity between that sort of macho Hemingway type mm -hmm. and and maybe what people think of Fleming and um, or think of Bond but actually we see there this this distinction and I really love the the iron filings and the nautical square mm -hmm. like there's there's something so sort of particular and um fresh about those descriptions I just want to point out in the chat that Christian has said smushed Milton Crest is almost the opposite of what happens to him in the film. Yeah, so <laughs> Milton Crest is, um, he, well, yeah, his head explodes essentially in Licence to Kill, yes, which, which is very, very different. But he, he has an even better fate in the short story, I think. My um, grandmother, who's a very proud grandmother, recently decided to watch Bond for the first time because she wants to support me. She's never seen a Bond film and Licence to Kill happened to be on the TV. <laughs> She she wrote to me afterwards saying, so it's quite violent. They're not all like this. Maybe they are. We did They're get into exploding heads through Bond. I see Chris, Chris has asked, did Fleming like Hemingway? I did look into this a little bit when I was doing an article about um, alcoholic drinks, uh, strangely. So Fleming is a massive fan of martinis and could never get a drink cool enough. He did all sorts of weird experiments with ice, trying to get his cocktails even colder. So um, I have a feeling I'm not entirely sure if they ever met. So if someone in the chat wants to kind of say either way, but I, I think I think. Um, I think they probably would have got on. Um, it's just that I think that that Milton Crest is just kind of pretentious. He's kind of pretend he's trying to pose as a Hemingway hero. Yeah, and there's and obviously there's a or I think there's a difference between Hemingway and the Hemingway type because Hemingway's myth has been kind of taken and built yeah. on. Um, I feel like there was some research done, and probably somebody uh, here um, will be able to follow this and complete my thought, but. There was some research done on Fleming's movements and it was found that he and Hemingway were in Jamaica at the same time for a period. Um, so probably they would have got roaringly drunk together, I think it's, it's fair to say, um, and then um, burnt all evidence of whatever happened that night. We can all imagine. Um, for my uh, villain introduction, I've gone also maybe a little less um, kind of iconic, a bit more obscure. So uh, Scaramanga in The Man with the Golden Gun. I really love this introduction because it feels very um, kind of high noon Western. We have Bond in a bar in a brothel and Scaramanga comes in and there's a sort of um, sizing up of each other. And then Scaramanga shoots this bird that the um woman who runs the bar has kind of kept as a as a pet um and in particular i love this um exchange between them so this is uh after he's killed the, the, the bird and the woman's upset um he said mister there's something quite extra about the smell of death care to try it 
He held out the glittering gun as if he was offering James Bond a rose. Bond stood quite still. He said, mind your manners, take your hand off me. Scaramanga raised his eyebrows. The flat leaden gaze seemed to take in Bond for the first time. He released his grip. James Bond went on round the edge of the counter. When he came opposite the other man, he found the eyes were now looking at him with faint, scornful curiosity. Bond stopped. The sobbing of the girl was the crying of a small dog. Somewhere down the street, a sound system, a loudspeaker, record player, began braying Calypso. Bond looked the man in the eye. He said, thanks, I've tried it. I recommend the Berlin Vintage, 1945. He smiled a friendly, only slightly ironical smile. But I expect you were too young to be at that tasting. So the reason I love that little kind of couplet of dialogue between them is this idea of, um, well, I love the line, there's something quite extra about the smell of death. Mm. You want to try it. And then Bond saying, I already have in 1945. I think it points to how important World War II is in the books. It keeps yeah. coming up as a kind of marker of who you are as a person. Um, and, you know, Bond will make an ally out of gangsters and drug dealers if they happen to be partisans in World War II. That, that for him is really central in his yeah. consciousness. Yeah, very much so. And that's the novel as well, where Bond really takes umbrage when a villain kills some animals. Isn't yes, that? yes. And another use of the word ironical. I think that's come up ironical. like five times in the passages that we've read already. There were a few words which I rem I'm i sure the editor, William Plomer, said, this isn't a word, Fleming, but he was just yes. like, and. <laughs> it was just like, it's staying in. <laughs> that happened with... Um... The way that he describes Money Penny's eyes, I I used in Double or Nothing, and then the copy editor was like, "This isn't a word." If Fleming says it's a word, it's a word. So I, I insisted. Did that you? We um, I know we're digressing here, but did you did you manage to sneak in any uh, neologisms yourself? Any oh, that's a good question. Energies? Um, I think I I often like to use verbs as nouns and nouns as verbs, which copy editors don't like me to do. Um, I won't bore on. I realise everybody just switched off the minute I said verbs as nouns and nouns as hey, verbs. I, my background's <laughs> linguistics as well. I'm all for this. <laughs> oh, our, our last... Oh, Ryan. Ryan's all for verbs and nouns. Our last little bit of readings that we want to share with you is two very small fragments of description. So yeah. over to you, David. Yeah, this comes from Casino Royale. Being as it's the 70th anniversary, I had to go back to Casino Royale. And it's from the very first chapter of Casino Royale. Um, Fleming actually uses this verb, sorry to be too grammatical. Uh, Fleming actually uses this verb in this way a few times across the books. But this is obviously the first instance. So Bond is tired famously. He's feeling his soul being eroded at three in the morning. And uh, after a long night of gambling, drink drinking and tension, He's headed back to his room. Uh, and I always love those moments in the early Bond films where Bond goes into his bedroom and checks all the traps and everything else that he's set, that kind of paranoia. Um, and it's just a couple of sentences. Bond knew exactly where the switch was. And it was with one flow of motion that he stood on the threshold with the door full open, the light on and a gun in his hand. The safe, empty room sneered at him. And for me, it's that use of that verb sneered, the fact that, you know, um, in education, we call it personification. Uh, but essentially, the room has taken on human qualities and it's mocking Bond for his for his paranoia. For And then a couple of paragraphs later, he says he didn't doesn't feel silly about being this. Fleming does that all the time. I've noticed whenever something might be silly like a villain dressed as a cowboy um, or um, any any other time things are getting very outlandish. He goes, this might have been silly. However, it wasn't. Um, and Fle Fleming does it here. So it's like the room sneered at Bond, but we're not going to take it too far and ridicule Bond. But we are going to point out that he's, um, yeah, that he's he's kind of outside the realm of everyday existence, that he does these things that we would consider just really weird. Why is that guy just standing in his doorway looking around at this empty room and it's sneering at him for his for his fear, essentially? I love those moments. Absolutely. And there's another really nice moment in Casino Royale where he explains himself and, you know, when when he's talking to Vesper about the food and the drink that he likes and he says, I realise this might all sound kind of fussy and old maidish, but I have to 
um, take a lot of attention over details. And he says, partly it's because I'm a bachelor, uh, so I'm alone and I have no one else to kind of take care of them um, for me, which is obviously both an indication of the time, but also an indication of his loneliness. Uh, but then he also goes on to say that uh, details save his life. It's important that he cares about those small things. So I think you're completely right. We have these moments where we almost um, see perhaps his self-consciousness and mm. then the text recovers it and kind of makes him mm. cool again. Mm. Um, and we had uh, a few more nice comments in the chat. Thank you. Including uh, one about Hemingway from Mark, who I just wanted yeah. to point out. Um, because I Mark pointed out that Fleming and uh, Pedro Armandares, the actor who played Karen Bay in From Russia With Love, talked about Hemingway's recent suicide when they were in Turkey. And then, of course, Petra, who was suffering from cancer, also later committed suicide. Um, it's really, really sad. So it's 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 really fascinating to think about those. For me, I find it fascinating to think about those moments in history um, where we have these kind of, uh, almost these currents that overlap each other. Mm. Um, so thank you very much. Um, uh, Ryan is the only one requesting, although uh, maybe there's a couple, no, there's a lot of thumbs up in this one. Keep talking about verbs and nouns. <laughs> um we we could literally just talk about that all night maybe <laughs> yeah maybe a, a a session for another time yeah um <laughs> if we run out of questions at the end yeah I'll go on about verbs and nouns. I want one example of a verb you used as a noun that your editor didn't like um let's see so while Kim thinks for podcast listeners that's uh that's Kim's mum uh, okay. <laughs> the only person who has the power to make me uh, she has the power she's host for tonight. Um, my husband is co-host so hopefully <laughs> they're not fighting for control in, in behind the scenes yeah these are our two cues um <laughs> so i mean i've got a wild and true relation more in my head because that's um just what i've been doing um readings from um but i had there a description um of the of the sand as an indigo scuttle so i was using scuttle oh. as a noun um and obviously that got three question marks in the margin uh, but i think i overruled them <laughs> oh so i was going to read you a little bit of description uh from goldfinger and i also wanted to point out the new goldfinger edition has this beautiful Gorgeous. gold foil thumbprint which i love um so this is just a description of the landscape. I think Fleming is a beautiful place writer. And of course, he was a travel writer before he um, uh, wrote spy fiction. I'm sure you all know Thrilling Cities, but if you don't, I'd really recommend his travel writing. Um, and this is a description from the train on the way to Kentucky. Slowly, the red dawn broke over the endless plain of black grass that gradually turned to the famous Kentucky blue as the sun ironed out the shadows. I really love the sun ironing out the shadows. And I love that we have um, three colors here in one sentence. He's such a visual writer. And I feel like that really impacted the style of the films. Very much so. So uh, if folks mm -hmm. want to begin putting um, questions in the chat for us, um, while you think of your questions, um, uh, do type them out if you can. If it's too long to type, just raise your virtual hand. David and I are going to cover our last point, I think, which was um, why both of us think after 70 years uh, since the publication of Casino Royale, James Bond has remained so everlasting. So, David, what's your view? Oh, um, you know, I'm still wrestling with this question, why Bond has such a wide appeal. Um and I always just keep thinking of that. Is it Raymond Mortimer, the quote about, you know, Bond is what every man would want to be and what every woman would want between his she their sheets or something like that. Um, and I, I actually think that's incredibly reductive because I know you and I have talked about this in the past. We we want to be James Bond. Um, we, you know, it, it, regardless of who you want to identify, you have bow ties at the ready. In fact, I'm actually going to undo my bow tie at this point because I, it's absolutely sweltering in our top bedroom. So there we go. And I'm just doing that just to prove that it's, uh, you know, I did actually tie a real one. Uh, yeah, we I think we all want a, a part of us. I think all of us want to be James Bond to an extent. and um, you know, I've, I've written a lot about this, but I think it's because Bond is that brilliant mix of masculine and feminine. Um, and I think because he's not like your typical, like John Buchan style hero, you said Bulldog Drummond, those kind of, if you read the heroic stories, the pulpy kind of fiction of that time, even some of the literary fiction of the time, um, the characters are really hard to relate to. 
Um, and I think there is a lot about Bond that is very outlandish, but there's also a lot that's really down to earth. And we touched on some of those examples earlier. And I think, you know, Ryan also just put something in the chat about Bond checking he, out his hotel rooms is his whole adult James Bond fantasy. We can all check into a hotel room and go, right, where are the bugs that we need to squish grapes into? I know that's more from the films than the books, but they, they very, very much take that inspiration from the films. Such really down to earth, grounded things, um, which weren't as down to earth and grounded 70 years ago, you know, being able to all the foreign travel and the food, you know, avocado pears and as dessert um, and all that kind of stuff from 70 years ago, which um, would have seemed really exotic then. But for some reason, it still seems sort of exotic now, even though we can recreate those experiences. It's still I suppose it's like trying to pin down what makes something cool. As soon as you try to kind of try and define it, it stops being cool. But Fleming managed it 70 years ago and we're still reading him today. Absolutely. I think you've nailed it there. James Bond is the definition of cool because he is cool in a way that feels both attainable and unattainable. Yeah. So this character is iconic. There's enough about him that's indelible, that's these kind of essential ingredients that you've got to capture in order for it to feel like Bond. Um, and in that way, he has almost the two dimensionality of an icon, but he's also a rounded character capable of change. And that's been baked into him from the beginning. We see him change through the arc of Casino Royale and then we see him continue to change. So he's a rounded character with who's multifaceted. Um, Ian Forster talks about the difference between a flat character and a round character. And he says a flat character never changes, mm -hmm. whereas a round character is capable of change and has the, the round, uh, you know, towards the curve. And that's the character arc. And I think the fact that he's capable of change makes him capable of evolution. So he's been able to both remain bond and change through the decades with us. So he's not a historical artifact. He remains relevant. And that mm -hmm. comes down to his humanity, I think. So when you look at Casino Royale, a moment like the moment towards the end where he wishes for a cheerful face and a comforting word and somebody to pat him on the back and say, well done, after he's won the card game. That's such a human desire. You know, there's nothing kind of grandiose about that. So we have this character who's indomitable and holds the line and is suave and funny and all those things, but he also occasionally just wants a pat on the back. So there's that real human element to him yeah. as well that I think makes us love him. I agree. Wow. So we have and some we have some amazing questions. I'm going to flip to gallery view so I can see everybody. So if you want to unmute and uh, say your questions, I think um, Ellie and Anthony have probably been keeping a better track of this than we have. We've got Ryan's a, got a great question there. I mean, they are all great questions, but Ryan's got a great question there. Ryan says, uh, I think my biggest question is, can we reach a point where Fleming will be taken more seriously as literature? rather than just genre fiction. I keep telling my friends who haven't read Fleming that the books seem to stand up better than serious, in quotes, literature like Hemingway today. Uh, what do you both think? Is Fleming truly more literary than his mainstream reputation? I would say absolutely he is. David, what's your view? I agree. I mean, um, was it about 15 years ago, Penguin published the books in the Modern Classics series, which for me said they're the canon they are in the canon of English literature now um alongside Hemingway et al um and I think partly because they are of their time but also that have that timeless quality which I think you need to have for a lot of great literature is um you know take any I don't know Alexandre Dumas or something like that the first thing I saw on the shelf there you know that was very much written of its time in the, those contexts of production and reception but you read it now and it's still a really good story but you can appreciate it as a product of its time as well so whenever I read a Fleming book and perhaps this is because I've you know I have got a literature background I I always kind of read it on two levels. Yes, I'm really enjoying the story, but also I'm analysing it as a product of its time. And I think that that's great literature. I think the literature that lasts is stuff that's really fun to read, but also has something else for your brain to chew on. Mm, absolutely. And it's really interesting you bring up the Penguin Modern Classic series because that's prefaced with um, a kind of epigraph from Umberto Eco, if I remember right, where he... Yeah. Um, says that the Penguin Modern Classics are talismans of literature. And he, of course, was always a Bond fan. And he has a great essay on Fleming's novels um, where he analyzes them from a structuralist point of view as fairy tales, which I would really recommend a read. Yeah. 
Um, but I think they are talismans of modern literature. And I also think as funny as it is to say, Fleming is an underrated writer, um, not underrated in that he created this icon that we still celebrate today, but I think he's an underrated prose stylist and it's mm. worth going to him for his style alone. And for me, that makes him um, certainly worthy of, of the canon. And, and the canon is an interesting idea who gatekeeps it, who kind of gets to decide the dividing line between so-called literary fiction and genre fiction. Um, but I think he's certainly a writer who um, can easily cross over between both camps if we want to think of it. As, I as think he's so different. economical with words. If yes. he, Perhaps if he was to, perhaps he'd be considered more literary if, and I realised this while we were choosing our descriptive passages, because there are a few there are some periods of really extended description in Fleming, like the opening of Diamonds Forever is amazing with the scorpion. Mm. It's just so well structured, that opening chapter, whatever else you think about the rest of that book, the the opening chapter is absolutely sublime. Um, and if he'd spent like twice as many words, I think more people would consider him more literary. But because mm. you can race through most Fleming novels in one sitting, if not, you know, two sittings at most, if you really want to, I think a lot of people perhaps perhaps don't um apply that label of literary yeah see this is why all of my novels are at least a hundred thousand words that's the cutoff point then your literature hundred thousand words that's it um, is that the mark yeah there, there's a good question here from christian that kind of fits with what you're talking about because he's talking about description of place and you're talking about descriptive writing i don't know if if you can see it there um of all the locales that Fleming described, which one made you think I need to go there the most? And if you did get there, providing it existed, did it live up to Fleming's description? Mm, really nice question. Um, so what's immediately come to mind isn't actually from the novels, funnily, but from Thrilling Cities, his description of Berlin. Um, so Berlin is one of my favourite cities in the world, and he writes about it from a very... A personal standpoint because of losing his father and his brother in the wars um so he he touches on that but he also he gets taken to nightclubs and he gets taken to the east side and the west side and um he gets shown the Cabusier buildings and I, I really love modernist architecture he absolutely hated it um hence uh, Goldfinger becoming a villain um but when I went to Berlin you know having read Thrilling Cities as a teenager I really felt like it did live up to it and it had that um, feeling of history happening in the now which he talks about in his description I think for me and I know I've only just got back from there but it has to be Japan because I I, I obviously read you only twice years before I went to Japan um, and it's also of course Tokyo is there in thrilling cities as well um, I actually tried to kind of find where to, um, Fleming had stayed in, in Tokyo uh, when we were there and um, yeah it's it, it it does have that um kind of exoticism even today um which which Fleming puts across so I mean for me it it's it's even better than Fleming describes it but um yeah there's so, there's so many places in some parts as well which Fleming never visited but actually um he references quite a lot it's almost like he's like Cuba comes up in the Bond novels an awful lot and I was I was fortunate enough to go there last Christmas um and you kind of think why did he never go here he was literally flying over it a lot of the time. And, you know, he's right next door in Jamaica. You know, he could have popped over and had a had a daiquiri with Hemingway, but he never wanted to go there himself for some reason. It's really difficult to kind of pinpoint why I had a talk with Andrew Lysette, Fleming's bi um, one of Fleming's biographers about it as well. And it's, it's just really difficult. But um, yeah, a lot of places that Bond never really actually goes to and Fleming never went to, but are mentioned as well, I think are worth including. Mm. I wonder if he, I never thought about that before. It's a really interesting question. I wonder if he didn't want to take him to Cuba because it would be too close to the miss, the missile crisis and, and the action. Whereas Bond in some ways is a bit like, um, there's this idea in historical fiction that George Lukács, who was a Hungarian Marxist critic, put forward in a book called The Historical Novel, where he um, kind of theorizes this structure for historical novels and He's, he's looking back at Walter Scott and those kinds of classic books. And he says that characters, heroes, have to stand enough outside of the action that they can have their own story mm. that's pivotal to the end result, uh, but not so close to the action that they'd, they'd almost be supplanted by the king who they were standing next yeah. to, or the president or whoever. And um, perhaps Cuba's almost kind of too real. Bond has yes. to be in Jamaica. He has to be yeah. sort of one step out. 
That's a really good point. And I know we're not we're talking about Fleming, but um, if you think about like Charlie Higson's recent on His Majesty's Secret Service, it's like it's a, the story that no one would ever know what happened behind the scenes. You know, you couldn't you couldn't talk about the coronation being upset and something on that grand scale. You know, mm. it's it's kind of like Bond is always in the sidelines. Bond is always in the shadows. Yeah, yeah. so you can't really put him on the main stage politically, can you? Mm. How guilty would Charlie Hickson have felt if something did go wrong with the coronation? Oh, I know. I did that would have been super news- awkward. I did see a few news headlines about um, some sensationalist tripe from some of the tabloids in the in the run up. Um, after I'd just literally finished reading it um, a few days before it was released, and I was like, "Oh God, okay, that <laughs> it really is trying." You know, it, it, it's 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 a bit like tomorrow never dies. Um, it, it felt a bit like that. Um, mm. I've just noticed in the question before we miss it, Mark Ashby says, uh, "Do you pluck your do you pluck your hair to put across doorways?" Um, <laughs> I I don't. Kim, you do, yeah. Literally any door I go through, whether it's a hotel door or not, uh, because you never know who's following you. You've got to be careful. That's my rule. Uh, we going also from have... um, going from like um, places to things. Um, Gilles asks a question around. Yeah mind control ice cream um from john gardner's continuation novels um and it makes me think of on on her majesty's with all the food that that they're, they're um ingesting allergens but um is there a plot i'm, I'm point? dying to know which john gardner novel involves mind control ice cream i feel i'm i feel i've read it but i can't actually remember Jill might want to put it in there but um the question is essentially why do we um is there something from Fleming that we really want to see in the films, a plot point or a character? I've got kind of like, yeah, I've got a plot point. What about you, Kim? Um, well, there are a lot of my favourite Fleming female characters haven't made yeah. it to screen yet. So I, it's not really a plot point, but but character, I would love to see Gala Brand um, yeah. on film. I think she's just one of the best characters and she's not made it yet. For me, I in fact, I almost chose it as my descriptive passage today, but it was a little bit long. Um, I love the scene, partly because I'm terrified of water myself. But I um, I love the scene in Live and Let Die where Bond has to do a long swim to mm-hmm. Mr. Big's Island. And he's looking around terrified at, um, you know, shark, barracuda. He's grabbed by an octopus at some point. I would love to see like a really kind of scary swim sequence at night in Bond. And there is a there is a brilliant description where I can't resist. Sorry. It says above him, the surface of the sea was a canopy of quicksilver. It crackled softly like fat frying in a saucepan. And you can imagine Bond looking up at the surface of the sea and it being this, you know, because Bond spends a lot of time in the ocean in the books like Fleming did. Um, but it suddenly becomes something quite terrifying. I'd like I'd like to see that, that in one of the films. Mm, yeah. And the the difference between the, the books and the films, again, um, we have a question uh, from Nick. And this puts me in mind of that distinction. Um, Nick says, would Bond be as iconic or likable if he was a better spy? Um, i.e. if he used different names and covers and wasn't just constantly blurting my name's Bond, James Bond, and if he couldn't be compromised with drinks or gambling or women. And um, it puts me in mind of John le Carré, who said that Bond would be the spy most likely to defect, like the least trustworthy, because Russia could blackmail him on so many points, um, whether it's champagne and benzedrine or um, the many women in and out of his bedroom. Um, And there's something about that I think in the in the books versus the films in the books we get a little bit more attempt at cover names and that kind of thing whereas in the films obviously part of what's iconic is him just coming out with Bond James Bond so we don't have so much kind of mucking around with cover names and things like that what's your favorite it's just random question Kim but what's your favorite cover name out of all of the cover names Bond has um I is um... is it him who chooses Somerset yeah, so him De- Carib, yeah. Somerset, um, name, uh, an homage to Somerset Maugham. The, yeah, uh, that's my favourite. One of Fleming's mentors. I like Mark Hazard. <laughs> yes, that's good. <laughs> in, you know, it's like, what an inconspicuous name, <laughs> Mr Hazard. <laughs> in, yeah. in The Man with the Golden Gun. I just love it. Yeah, that's pure nominative determinism. It's like it Fleming is. gave him a really bland name. But mm-hmm. in Bond's mind, he's like, if only I had a name that really lent itself to being a spy. So he's decided to call himself Mark Hazard. There's two questions that are somewhat similar. Um, Natasha asks what 
order you'd suggest mm -hmm. and mark asks if you could suggest the first fleming book someone should read in the bond series which one would you choose oh two really good questions i would recommend people read them in order although that's not what i did but just to appreciate that character arc that bond goes through um but if someone told me look i'm just going to read one fleming I would say make it from Russia with love. It's my favorite novel. I love the structure. I love seeing Bond from the enemy's perspective. I think it's brilliantly plotted. Um, and it's almost, if you're going to read one, it's almost a beginning, middle and end for Bond because Fleming considered killing him at the end. So it, it does almost read as an ending. David, yeah. how about you? I'm tempted to agree, but um, for me, and it's always in my top three, the most exciting I think is Live and Let Die. Um, and it is sufficiently different. It's kind of reminiscent of the films because a lot of the elements we use, particularly in the film of License to Kill and less so even in Live and Let Die. And some of the elements appear in other things as well. But I just think it has such brilliant characters um, and the storyline is sort of quite slight. It's not um, there's there's not a lot of um, kind of duplicity or anything else going on. People just, you know, say what they mean a lot of the time. But there's just such kind of tension throughout that whole book, um, I think. Um, so I, ha I have in the past recommended Live and Let Die to people and um, they haven't regretted starting there and have gone on to read the rest. But it is so difficult to choose. Mm, it really is. And I think also they they're all they're all different. And that's one thing that stands Fleming apart from, say, modern crime writers where um in modern publishing if you have a hit you're told to do it again just do the same thing again um whereas Fleming is innovating structurally book to book you know when you compare say um Casino Royale with The Spy Who Loved Me you yeah. you wouldn't know until three quarters of the way through The Spy Who Loved Me that it's even a Bond novel so he's because it's in first person from the main um female character's perspective Vivian Michelle and Bond only turns up on page yeah. 70 or something um, I've realised, I, and I might have got this the wrong way around myself, but Mark has actually said, which film would you recommend to someone who's never oh. read Fleming that's the closest in mood to the book? So that's kind of almost like the other way around. Mm. That is really, really tough, to be honest. I'm not sure any of the films made to date really capture what I feel when I read a Fleming book. I don't know if you're the same, Kim. That's a cop-out answer, I know. It's giving me thinking. Can, I, can I just put mine in? I. Go on. A lot of people say I'm Majesty's Secret Service, but I think the closest one when I read the books was from Russia with Love. I think the mood in the film, it gets closer to Fleming, if maybe not necessarily, I mean, plot-wise as well, but the mood definitely. Mm, I agree. I think that for me, from Russia with Love is my favourite book and film. Um, and that probably is because they are quite, they are quite similar and they do have that shared DNA and from Russia with Love, for me, captures kind of what's classic about the Bond films. And mm. um, we've got the train journey, we've got the grey suit, we've, we've got all of those elements. It's also quite sort of Hitchcockian in its style. Um, so we've got that very kind of classic spy feel. Um, we've I, got I, I, I suppose in terms of From Russia with Love, um, the thing for me, though, with the book that I think is genius is the structure of it, where you don't have Bond for the first chunk of it. And uh, although that would be really daring in a film to go 45 minutes without seeing James Bond and everyone talking about him, if anyone ever wants to have a go at making a stage play uh, mm -hmm. um, of James Bond, I think From Russia With Love is probably your best bet because you could do that as, you know, act one and then have Bond appear in act two. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, as you're describing that, I've realised that's just all of what Double or Nothing is. Basically, it's just yeah. act one of From Russia With Love. <laughs> Delayed, um, delayed gratification yeah exactly uh we have just a couple for, of i was gonna say just for those listening on the podcast who wanted to know which bond book it was with the mind control ice cream yeah uh, chris and um jill realize it is for special, special services. services i don't i think i've read that one it was a while ago though excellent hive mind uh, we have a couple of lovely questions from um chris uh, Fleming plays with structure in almost every book. What are your thoughts on his use of flash forwards and back views from different characters? Um, and Kim, did uh, this play with did this play with structure influence your writing at all? 
Um, it absolutely did. So for those of you who've read Double or Nothing, you'll, you'll know that I do quite a lot of flash forwards and flashbacks, particularly as a way to keep Bond present, even though he's absent. So he's there in people's memories and hopefully his shadow kind of falls across the present. And it's something that I've thought about for the future books as well. How can I keep playing with structure to keep them fresh and make each book its own entity as well as connected to each other? David, what do you think about Fleming's structural innovations? I think it's it's something that is really underrated. Um, and the way he puts those, um, you know, it's better to travel, hopefully, um, than never than to arrive. Um, I, I do think that's something that could be played with. It might come across as a bit postmodern in cinema if they were to try and adapt those a bit, a bit kind of like um Quentin Tarantino with chapter headings and all that kind of stuff, but um yeah it's I, I would like to see a little bit more that's that is probably my number one wish for the films going forward that they they innovate narrative structure wise and mm. that's a really nerdy thing to admit I, I for me that was one of my favorite aspects of no time to die the beginning that we were playing with with time um and obviously time, time yeah. in the data. um have we got to everybody's questions uh cues have we missed anybody I'm just checking. If anyone does want to unmute as well and ask a question in person. I no, think they not. mostly have been answered yeah. pretty much, but oh, a new one oh, we've got another one coming in. Um, Natasha. Well, it's oh. not so much a question, but <laughs> just being very nice. Uh, Natasha says, in Double or Nothing, I really like the flashbacks regarding Joseph Dryden's injuries in the blast where he lost his hearing. Thank you so much. That was actually... Um, Writing that passage was key for me in unlocking Dryden's character. So although it comes quite deep in the book as you read it, for me, it almost felt like the beginning of his character because it's where his relationship with his body and his sense of self goes through a fundamental shift after he's injured in Afghanistan. And it wasn't until I'd written that flashback that I really felt like the character was unlocked and I understood who this man was and how his sense of self and trust in his body and sense of himself as a warrior had to adapt after that injury and how important because of that being able to serve as a double O was for him and that that felt to me I remember actually once I'd written that passage feeling like almost a physical sense of relief um of okay I've got this character now I've, I've got a handle on them I know what I'm doing so thank you very much I think okay, you've really got a good different. question here from Christian. Uh, anything you can tease about your second double O book? Oh, that's it. That's the end of the evening. Um, we're... <laughs> Zoom just cuts out. That's <laughs> it. Oh, oh, look, the internet's gone. Uh, Edward says, I can't seem to raise my virtual hand, but I have a question which is a bit complicated to type. Over to you. Feel free to unmute yourself. You, Edward. You're not off the hook with your second book there, Kim. Shh, it'll go away if we don't address it. <laughs> oh, well, I think you're still muted. Yeah, I think Edward's a bit quiet. Oh no, you're not muted, but for some reason we can't. No, hear I you. could hear. I could hear you a little bit. No. Um. There we go. How, how's that? How's that? That's that... perfect. Thanks, Edward. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um. Yeah. The um. Um, when, when I when I when I read the read, uh, Fleming when I was uh, young, I don't know 12, 13 years old or something, there were there were bits in it that I just didn't understand. But it was but Fleming still carried me along and 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 I absolutely loved them and and it all added to the exotic sort of qualities about it. I mean, one uh, example is that well, food is one, but also um, the uh, when in on a match uh, on on a Majesty service when Fleming mentions Bond winning he, winning his golden K at skiing. You know, it's sort of king for a beer walk. I mean, it was anything when you're in your early Bond reading experiences that were not really were a bit were a bit sort of incomprehensible, but yet there was there were there were the essence of Fleming. Absolutely, that's such a nice question. Thank you. Um, so many things, and they remain a mystery to me today. I know absolutely nothing about golf, so a large chunk of Goldfinger is fairly lost on me. Um, I'm terrible at all card games, so it's a good idea for you to challenge me to poker if you ever meet me in person. Um, you'll you'll walk away the winner. And um, I also can't drive. So what does that leave me? Uh, not much. <laughs> David, how about you? 
Um, how to hijack a plane. I, I, I never re I remember trying to get through those chapters in Thunderball because it's quite in some detail. And he kind of there's this thing where Patachi like throws diamonds down to see whether the gas. And to be honest, I read that now and I'm just like, I still don't really understand what the hell's going on here. Um, so um, and I'm not sure Fleming did, to be perfectly honest, um, <laughs> but because it, it was the first Bond book I ever read. Um, there are, and you know, all of the, yeah, there's, uh, and then there's, there's, there's that weird kind of encounter, which I actually love now with like the, the mod taxi driver at the start. And I knew nothing about 1960s culture and bond rubbing up against that. There are so many, str I mean, as, as I go back to what we said, like as an eight year old, I'm thinking what on earth must I have made of this book? Can I, um, can I just say that taxi driver sequence? I love yeah. that. Yeah, it's great. I love that because Bond gets into that car thinking this guy is typical today's youth, and by the end of the journey, he, he they respect each other. Yeah, they do. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's it. Because and going back to what we said earlier, it's like Bond is that mixture of modern and 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 traditional. And Bond is actually quite an open-minded character in lots of ways. Mm -hmm. I know Kim and I talk about this a lot, but politically, Bond is a left of center person. He's always not very progressive, but a bit progressive. He's always something, you know, you could take ran, you could take particular sentences out of Fleming in isolation and say, oh, that's not especially progressive. But then you actually see in part of the whole, and you go, actually, generally, Bond is quite a quite a quite an open-minded person i always think of the sequence where in you only live twice he meets dicko henderson and henderson's saying all this kind of slightly kind of racist homophobic stuff and bond is like you know uh and bond gets called a ponce by henderson as well and i'm just like bond's just kind of taking it but also kind of saying this guy's like larger than life um, I don't agree with what he's saying necessarily, but I'm we're kind of going to get on with each other. And in the end, they're kind of friends. And I, I, yeah, I do see that open mindedness in a lot of in a lot of Bond's character books. Do you see that in Fleming as well, though? Because he's he he's criticised for for having sort of gay villains and yeah. and being maybe homophobic. But he's got friends like Noel Coward. And, yeah, yeah. And uh, Somerset Maugham. Yeah, yeah, it's a real contradiction. I, I don't, I don't know if he's necessarily, you know, like Doc. Uh, famously, he sent um, Doctor No's, uh, you know, one of the, one of the, uh, I think one of the drafts of Doctor No or one of the proofs to Noel Coward, and um, Noel Coward sent back an amusing kind of memo about um, to, to Fleming or uh, a letter that said, you know, you might have even gone too far giving girls boys bottoms this time Ian um you know they had that kind of relationship um and I always think what we 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 need to kind of separate the fact that you know Fleming himself was quite open-minded and then he was writing for an audience that might not have been quite so open-minded and I think it kind of meets somewhere in the middle of that mm. and it's also it's worth thinking about the um contradictions if you want to think of it that way or the um contrast in the 1950s and 60s when he's writing so people will often say dismissively well bond is a product of the 50s um as if that's only one thing but of course in the 1950s we have um the growing civil rights movement growing feminism we have the creation of the nhs we have all of these discussions going on about how to rebuild society after the war um, and Fleming, I think, picks up on those currents. So he reflects a society that's in dialogue with itself about what it wants to be. And that's perhaps why sometimes there's a sense of contradiction or a sense of this being quite a live wire, how we read politics in the book. Mm -hmm. On uh, the note of um, boys, girls, bottoms, <laughs> I, I see that we've... Uh, run a little bit over time uh, yeah um, um yeah no chris eels has said i love moonraker but does anyone know how to play bridge i think that's a really great way of kind of summing up the fact that there are so many things in these bond books and no matter how many times i've read each bond book i've lost count to the amount of times but there's always something which i always kind of take away differently every time um i haven't yet learned how to play bridge unfortunately or to be perfectly honest any of the card games so i was quite 
I was quite happy when they replaced the card game in the film of Casino Royale with Daniel Craig with Texas Hold'em Poker because that is literally the only card game I can play. But <laughs> I, I think they're so well written that you don't necessarily need to know those things um, and you just kind of get carried carried away with it, really. Um, but yeah, they they're just we can just keep going back to them, can't we? And just finding even more. Absolutely. I think that they are endlessly rereadable and mm. they also reward rereading because Bond's character has that depth and multifacetedness. So each time you pick up on something new about his character and something new about how Fleming is responding to the world around him and shaping the world around him, which is yeah. something that obviously the films have continued to do. And, and that example of switching out to Texas Hold'em Poker is a great example. I remember at the time, you know, Bond fans were saying, but hang on, that's not the book. And the marketing folks behind the films were saying, well, it's it's really popular online now. So we're going with that. So we have this kind of constantly changing world that Bond is keeping up with and shaping at the same time. Um, so perhaps now is a time to raise our glasses or cups of tea or coffee, depending on where you are in the world. Um, I've still got dregs wish, of a martini left. <laughs> wish James Bond a very happy 70th birthday. Happy birthday, James. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Cheers, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us. This was so lovely. I immediately want to do it all over again. So maybe we will at some point. Yes, thank you, everybody. And thank you so much for all your comments as well. I desperately hope we haven't missed any. Um, um, my husband is suggesting Casino Royale Reboot will have a Fortnite contest. Um, <laughs> that's, only be that's only because he's seen Never Say Never Again recently and he's now convinced that video games <laughs> have a role in James Bond films. <laughs> uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you for your um, nice comments in the chat. It's so lovely to see um, your virtual faces and names. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. <laughs>